<laughs> okay, so uh, Tavang, thank you so much again for you know taking time out of your busy day. I know you I know you're practicing, and I think you had two hearings today, so you must be exhausted. Um, I'm good to go. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So um, Tavang and I have uh, kind of uh, we've got a. Uh, a relationship that goes back uh, quite a few years now. You've been teaching for NCA Tutor for a few years. Um, you've also been practicing. Uh, you've been a mentor to uh, internationally trained lawyers as well. Um, you've been doing all that stuff. So um, thank you so much for really volunteering a lot of your time. Um, to help internationally trained lawyers, to help people, you know, that are coming in after you, right, coming into the profession. And that's a huge help. So uh, really appreciate you being here. No, for sure. Thanks for having me. Always, I'm always, always excited to, to sit down with you and have a conversation outside of tutoring. And yeah, man, I'm, this is a great platform and I hope it's something that keeps going. Because, yeah, it, it's it's really... It's a bit lonely out there as a as a foreign trained you know student. So uh, you know these this is I think these interactive moments help a lot. For sure, and we're we're adapting because years ago, um, you know, we used to get together in person, right? So we would hold uh, we would hold these live networking sessions. We'd go out to a pub. We'd just meet people, yeah. interact, network, and. And so we are adapting and we're trying to, you know, we're facing this new reality here of COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we're doing the best we can. And, and this is amazing that we get to do this, that we get to interact with people on these various platforms. So we've got, we're, we're streaming right now to both Facebook and YouTube. And for those of you that are watching, um, please uh, ask questions, um, use the comment sections of the videos to ask, uh, to bang any questions you like. Um, today, I think the focus and the emphasis is going to be on some of the elective uh, subjects that Tabang has a lot of experience, in fact, teaching, and that is commercial law, tort law, civil litigation, contracts. Um, so those are the subjects that we're going to be highlighting today. But uh, if you have any other questions outside of, you know, those subjects, we'll, we'll welcome them as well. Um, so uh, perhaps we'll get uh, just start a little bit with, you know, what did you do today? <laughs> Tell me about your day today, because uh, you had two hearings and now you're here doing this, some volunteer work, and that's amazing. So yeah. you know, give me a typical day uh, as a civil litigation lawyer, and I know you practice criminal law as well. <clears throat> yeah. So um, today was a sort of a standard run of the mill day. Either, um, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with civil procedure yet, either I'm in discoveries or I'm um, arguing motions mostly. Um, from time to time, we'll do a mediation. Um, but you know, civil litigation is mostly about resolving cases. So if I'm not doing that, I'm on the phone, negotiating, uh, trying to reach a resolution. Um, in civil litigation, I'm primarily a personal injury lawyer. So I deal with, you know, your typical motor vehicle accidents, slip and falls, uh, you know, sometimes catastrophic type injuries. So um, yeah, it's it's a fast paced um, industry that I'm in, but I, I enjoy it. Um, today I had two motions that I appeared for. Um, one was contested, one wasn't. And yeah, unfortunately today the facts, the law was not on our side, so it was a, it was a long one, um, but I made it out just okay and um, clients are still satisfied, but it, it's, that's typically what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Great. What, what, what does that look like in the, you know, in today's day and age with COVID? Oh so, to, you know, tell us a little bit about that. So are, are you going into the courtroom? Um, yeah. So we, we, yeah. So it's, it's video, right? Everything is on Zoom. Uh, we don't robe anymore. Um, so we wear suits. Um, so you don't have to robe. Typically, you'd have to robe before judges, before you, you know, appear before judges. You have to robe up. So we don't have to do that anymore. I find the process a bit uh, more simpler. Um, it's it's actually, it's I, I like 
to advocate from the comfort of my my house. And sometimes I'm in on my couch and I'm and I'm doing this. So yeah. it's 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 pretty cool. Um, uh, it it looks like uh, it, you're in court. It's still a courtroom, so it looks like how it would look, except for you're on on screen and you're not obviously on your feet. You're you're sitting down. So um, it's it's a bit. It can be complicated, you know, if you have clients on on the screen and you know they want to you know say a couple things while you're advocating and they kind of have to maintain their composure and all that so it's it, it's difficult sometimes to control uh you know everybody that's on screen but it it's for me i find it better than actually appearing in person some of my colleagues you know feel like they want to go back to to being in person but i'm i'm just fine <laughs> where i'm at <laughs> from that spot on your couch, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Maybe maybe it's a good segue into talking about civil litigation as a NCA subject. So um, mm. I know that a lot of students, um, especially those who you know go abroad and do a two-year LLB. Um, they have to take a couple of electives at least, right? The minimum assessment there would be seven exams, right? Provided you've ticked all the other boxes. So if you if you got to do seven exams, there are only five mandatory core subjects that must be taken. Um, yeah. And then you've got some electives to choose from. And uh, some of the electives are the ones we listed off earlier. And, uh, you know, I think civil litigation is quite important. You know, I'm also practicing um, civil litigation, and um, but you teach the subject. So, you know, tell us what your thoughts are on civil lit. Should people be taking this subject? Um, I I honestly think that civil procedure. I, I'd hope that in the future, civil mm -hmm. procedure is not an elective and actually becomes one of the mandatory sort of the core courses that everybody has to take. I'm, I'm really surprised that criminal law and criminal procedure are mandatory, but civil procedure isn't. And the reason why I say this is because if you're not going to enter into the regulatory or criminal space, you're most likely going to end up in the civil litigation space. And doing civ pro at the NCA level sort of gives you a head start because Civil litigation is the biggest section on your barrister um, uh, exam, which is um, one aspect of the bar exam that everybody is going to write. And I find that individuals struggle when they reach that point because they haven't had that base knowledge on the NCA uh, level. So I think it's better to get started with Civ Pro right from the beginning because it's going to follow you. And a lot of the opportunities are in civil a lot of foreign trained lawyers are civil litigate, litigators, whether it's general practice or a more focused practice like tort or, uh, you know, business partnerships, whatever people uh, get into. It's all civil procedure. You're navigating the, the, the civil, uh, the rules of civil procedure. So it's, it's very, very important. If you are to choose um, your electives, I would recommend to choose um, civil procedure plus perhaps another course of your interest. But I think civil procedure is very important. And I think at one point, I, I really hope it becomes mandatory. mandatory. Well, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, students saying, well, tell me what the easiest course is. What's a bird course? Um, and, yeah. and, and, you know, should I take some sort of bird course if there is such a course? I'm not sure whether there is. I, I think it's highly subjective, I, of course. Yeah, I would <clears> say, <throat> yeah. Um, I, I, I try to nip that mindset in, in uh, right away because even, even as a lawyer, um, your seniors, uh, cause I'm still junior, your seniors are going to be looking to see if you're willing to take on challenges and not, you know, trying to take on the most comfortable uh, piece of litigation, you know, maybe to look good at the end of the day or to win or to make sure. No, um, always, always challenge yourself. And I think it starts with the NCA. I think instead of trying to choose the easier course, I think it's important to think about what you want to do. It's very difficult 
at the NCA stage to truly, truly know where you want to end up, but give it a thought and try to channel, you know, your courses that way. I mean, I, I took Civ Pro because I knew I wanted to end up in civil litigation, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I took commercial because I knew that that probably could be a route that I might take as well. So you're not looking for the easiest course. You're looking for the course that will propel you to where you want to get to in, in future. And I, I, I know people say, well, oh, it's just, you know, you just need a 50. You're just reading. It's just books. You're never going to look at that stuff again. That's not true. Um, when you get into practice as a junior, you will be relying on those bar materials. You will be remembering that NCA course material um, because they're rules and you need to know what the rules are to navigate yourself through, through a, a complex system and to help your clients navigate through the system. You want to be sure about what you do. So choose courses as well that you think you'll enjoy. That will help you as well to pass. It will make the st studying process much more easier and, and, and comfortable. So you're not looking for the bird courses. I, I, I just nip that in the butt r right away. No. Yeah, I, I'm, I think I'm, we're in the same camp on this. Um, I think you should be taking courses that are going to be useful to your practice. Um, or at least that will assist you in the next stage, as you mentioned, the bar exams, right? So in Ontario, at least, some of you might be going through the licensing process in other provinces, but uh, at least for Ontario, civil litigation makes up a big portion of the barrister exam. As you said, uh, a lot of the materials are dedicated and a lot of the questions on the exam are geared towards civil litigation and uh, so prepping for that at the NCA level of course um, would be good now you teach both actually so you do teach the NCA uh, civil procedure course and then you also teach the barrister civil litigation section right. is there a lot of overlap yes yes almost almost everything except for I'd say the articles that you get with the, the NCA um, syllabus, almost everything will be in the bar exam, the, the civil litigation exam, plus more. Mm -hmm. So you have a head start. And I noticed the difference between the students who did do so on the NCA level versus the ones who are doing civil litigation. Um, um, uh, well, they all have to do civil litigation, but you can see the difference. and. I think it, it it's really eases that process. It's an exam you have to do, you can't avoid it. So it just helps to to do Civ Pro um, on the NCA level if you have the option to do so. Mm -hmm. And then we get into the bar and it makes the studying easier because it's the biggest section of the barrister exam. Criminal is a smaller section. Public law or admin law is smaller. So you, you really got it. I can't emphasize yeah. this. Enough. Yeah, yeah I, I think there are about 60 pages, uh, roughly, give or take some, uh, about 60 pages dedicated just to public law, which includes constitutional yeah. law, administrative law, and, right. and your foundations of Canadian law. That's three courses yeah. in, in about 60 pages of material. And then you look at, you know, civil litigation, which is massive and hundreds of pages. Um, yeah, there's a big difference. So, uh, yeah, definitely your public law courses make up a very small portion of the yeah. barrister exam. Yeah. And they take up a bigger portion, I'd say, of the NCA space, which is it's pretty strange to me because then hmm. how many of us are going to end up and I'm, I don't I don't mean to how do I put this in a nice way but really how many of us are going to end up being public public lawyers hmm. most of us we will end up being civil litigators and I don't you know I'm not saying that foreign trained lawyers or NCA students won't end up in that public space but it is more difficult to get in you know so it's it's, it's weird it's almost like it's backwards um the, the NCA stage, you know, foundations, admin, constitutional, that's that's what everybody talks about. And then you get to the bar and it's like this much. <laughs> <laughs> it's surprising. It's, it's very surprising. Yeah, so it's, it's yeah, it's, it's quite a... Uh, it's, it's, uh, quite the contrast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, let's perhaps we can move on to another NCA subject, which you and I have um, mm. heard a lot about recently because there have been quite a few students registering with us for remedial plans, mm. right? And and actually we we get quite a few remedial plans in all the subjects, but I think there was there's been a lot of remedial plans uh, in tort law recently. And perhaps I should preface with what a remedial plan is in case, um, in case our viewers don't know. So the NCA will allow you to, to attempt a subject three times at most. And if you fail a subject on your third attempt, af after your third attempt, there is one final Hail Mary, if you'll say, um, if you obtain a remedial plan um, and the remedial plan is either by taking a course in law school or taking a prep course um, with a company like ours, for example, and we set out a plan for you um, and we'll work with you. Um, all of our plans include, you know, private, individual handholding and, and tutoring, right, where we can actually review your work, review your writing, and show you how to improve it, right? And so we've been getting uh, a lot of students recently in torts, and, and do you think it's a harder course, or, or what's happening, I mean, as compared to the other courses? What are your thoughts on it? <clears throat> that's a good, that's a good question. I, yeah. I'm still, so far we've been successful, right, yeah. with, with the students that we've had. I'm still wrapping my head around it. But I think one of the bigger issues is um, individuals don't, I think they are relying too much on um, what I'd call the UK base law. So, and the NCA is looking for people to be on top of the updated materials and the updated case law and the Canadian interpretation on some of the principles that, you know, stem from the UK. And if, you know, individuals who've studied in the UK will understand, you know, your, your bigger cases like Donahoe versus Stevenson and, and sort of your big UK cases that have carried over into Canada. And I think people stop there with their analysis and they ignore some of the smaller, lower court Canadian cases. But you are in Canada, you are in Ontario, so we need to see that you actually are, are referencing those rules or those cases in your analysis. It doesn't help just to use, you know, the, 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 the original um, principle precedents from the UK. Hmm. Um, and then... It's just how to apply um, principles in court um, that I find are an, are an issue for a lot of, especially those who aren't from the UK or US jurisdictions. Um, they tend, individuals tend to struggle with causation, uh, you know, principles of negligence. Um, and I think it's just learning how to structure the information that they they absorb in a way that the examiners uh, would, would prefer. So I don't think it's harder than criminal. In fact, it's very similar to the way criminal law is applied. There's also causation analysis in criminal law as well. Um, there's also, uh, uh, I think, a relationship between those principles in the US and the UK with criminal law as well. So I wouldn't say tort is harder than any other subject. I'll just say that it's uh, there's there's people need to be more on top of their uh, Canadian case law and because the interpretations then start to change as you go up with the change with, right. with certain cases yeah yeah, yeah. Um, perhaps we can or you can tell me what does a remedial plan mean I mean what, what sort of things are you looking at when you're trying to help students um, and, and how do we go about doing that? I know, you know, you do that yourself. I also tutor students privately with remediation plans, but um, what's your take on the remediation plan and how do you work with those, with those I, individuals? I think for me, I focus on practice exams, uh, you know, 
just practice exam, practice exam, practice exam. Because I find with the remedial uh, students, the issue is how they are applying the information that they already know. It's their third time round. They've looked at the materials in and out. You know, they can literally tell you what the materials say and discuss it with you. But then you look at the feedback that they're getting and yeah, it's applying, um, you know, certain principles and, and answering in a structured manner, right? Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of individuals I find are struggling with IRAC or how to separate the issues from the rules and the analysis and mm-hmm. the conclusion. So I find that that's the biggest um, issue with, with remedial students. And once we get that done, they tend to, to pass. Once they understand how to just apply the information that they already know, they, they pass. Yeah. Can we, perhaps we can say it's maybe just a, a mismatch or a misunderstanding of what the expectations are for the yeah. exam. Because like you said, they know the materials. They just, they don't know how to present it um, in a way that's expected by the NCA. And I don't, I don't think it's very clear of what the expectations are. Right. We do have a syllabus and, and the syllabus may kind of hint towards analysis and, and all that. But in practice, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are some practice answers floating around, which don't really, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So, so yeah. the expectations, I think, are um, or I think people misunderstand what the expectations are from the NCA level. And, you know, one of the you know, top secrets, I'll give it out here, I don't mind. Um, You know, one of the secrets I tell students is, no, don't pay for practice exam, don't pay for practice answers that someone's written for you. I I can, you know, I've got this secret place where you can get practice answers for free. Thousands and thousands of practice answers for free. And they go, really, where? And I say, "It's it's called the Supreme Court of Canada's website. Right. You open up a decision and you actually read the decision. Have you ever seen an answer so perfect? Right. Have you ever seen an analysis? Right. So well presented. That's exactly what's expected of you on the exam. And, you know, uh, there's no magic pill to swallow. You read how they organize their decisions, how they set out the rules, how they apply themselves to, you know, the facts at hand. And and voila. You have a great answer, right? So yes, no yeah. shortcut. There's no, There's no shortcut. Right. You should read a few cases. And now I'm not saying you should read every single case that's on the syllabus, but um, reading a few major cases and looking at the way the answers are structured, the way the application is done, will go a long way in understanding what the expectations are in the NCA exams. Um, and, and don't rely on other people to, to do that for you, right? You can do that yourself. It, well, it's completely pointless because you you don't know what you're walking into when you get there, right? When mm-hmm. you get to the exam. So you have this set answer or set answers that you're relying on and you're hoping basically that you, you have a similar scenario pop up in your exam. And often that's not the case. And you've now spent a whole lot of money on, on, you know, buying these materials online. And, yeah, you just end up having to write it again and starting from scratch and, and having to, you know, read, reread or, or whatever have you. So I, mm-hmm. I think it's just, I, I, I've never seen those, by the way. I haven't seen any how those structured answers look like. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, no, I, I'd advise against that completely. Um, yeah, I mean, you could just get those structures from the Supreme Court itself, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's great, right? So people are shocked to find out that there are answers out there. I'm like, yes, they are. (laughs) And they're free. Uh, You can get them on Canly or you can get them on Lexum or, you know, right on the Supreme Court's website, um, where they report their cases. So, um, it's really useful to read those cases in full and, and understand how, judgments should be structured and right. oft, often you're expected to write you know the kind of decisions right and and that's how you'd be writing them so 
great tip from us today is is you know read a few decisions um, right. I think it'll go a long way in, in helping you understand what the expectations are for the exam and how to be structuring your, you know, how yeah. you should structure your answers. Just to interject, like I can't yeah. say that enough. Please. You can find how to do pith and substance, how to answer a charter question mm -hmm. in the decisions themselves. It's mm -hmm. there. It's not a, it's not magical. It's not a myth. It's, it's literally Peter Hawk doesn't get it anywhere else but the supreme court as well so mm -hmm. it's i find with constitutional a lot a lot of people want to know well, how do you do pittance how do you do child it's it's there, mm -hmm. it's, there. <laughs> it's there it's there yeah there. right it's it's true it's there it's there of course there are the nuanced cases and there are mm. cases where there are disagreement or inconsistencies even within the supreme court but that that's you know those are kind of rare you know, most of the law is settled right so uh, or much of the law is settled. There are, there are new evolving areas, as we see in administrative law. Um, it's still an evolving area um, and hopefully going the right direction these days. Um, but OK, we're not here to talk about constitutional and administrative law. Um, so so we've chatted about torts um, and I, and I agree. I don't I don't think there's um, anything in particular that makes torts more challenging. Um, uh, I think the subject and the content of the material is equally challenging, right, as yeah. some of the other subjects. Um, uh, but people fall into the trap of how to present that those materials mm -hmm. or perhaps relying on UK-based principles, as you say, mm -hmm. um, or they're relying on, you know, you know, materials from the UK themselves. I'm, I'm not sure, no. right? Um, so try and keep it Canadian-based, canadian focus. Uh, let's perhaps move on to contract law. Um, and, and contract law has been something that you've been working on for, for a while now with our students. Um, is this one of those courses that you think people should take, uh, contract law, or um, you know, does it affect your day to day in your practice? What are your thoughts? Uh, oh man, this is one of those where it yeah, it really depends <sighs> on again what what you want to do. I wouldn't I wouldn't push contract law the way I push civil procedure, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but the chances are is if you are a contract lawyer and you are doing partnership disputes, for example, and you end up in litigation, then contract and civ pros is really what you need to, to know. Mm -hmm. But if you want to work in-house, um, contract law is also important as well because you are going to be reviewing a lot of, of agreements and you know, you want to know the nuances when it comes to breaches of contract, um, uh, exemption clauses, you, you, you name it. So this a contract is not one of those where I'd say you've got to take, but I'd say, you know, if you are looking to work in a corporate space in-house or you want to deal with uh, um, institutional clients, then yeah, contract law would, would help. Out because usually those disputes surround some sort of breach of contract or some sort of um, issue with you know com complying with an agreement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, another course kind of perhaps I feel the same way about this course as you do with civil procedure would be business organizations, mm -hmm. um, and I know that's something you've worked on as well. Yeah. Um, it's just business organizations. Uh, perhaps I take it for granted because I, you know, I come from a business background. Um, you know, my undergraduate degree. Uh, you know, spent five years studying business and working in business, and and so it seems like second nature to me. But then I realized that we have a lot of lawyers that are getting qualified that have almost no experience in business, and. Yeah. Wow, there are so many areas of law that touch on business, like you know. I can't even think of a practice area that won't touch on business, yeah. right? You're doing estates, estate planning, that's going to be business. You're doing family mm -hmm. law, it's going to touch on business, mm -hmm. um, right? If you're division of assets and stuff like that and valuing businesses and stuff. I mean, you have to understand business law. Um, and I feel like it's such a crucial 
aspect, right? If you're working in house counsel, you know, yeah, you need to know business law. Um, so if it's an elective you're looking for, I think business law is incredibly useful. Um, it's called business organizations um, in the NCA level, and then for the solicitor exam. It is uh, the largest section of the solicitor that's exam. Another right? one. That, that's another one. Yeah, that's another one that prep that will prep you for for the bar on the solicitor side, right? Especially when it comes to and then there's tax law too on that as well, which is is a pretty big headache. But it helps if you already are prepared when it comes to. Um, business organization and association or, or, or business corporate law or the relationships, the shareholder, director. So if you already are, you know, at a certain level with your comprehension when it comes to that, and when you get to the tax aspect of the solicitor exam, then you can focus more on that and, and get on top of that and you're more likely to increase the chances of passing the solicitor exam. Mm -hmm. This is another big one. This is a huge one, I think. Um, definitely recommend taking business organizations. Now, perhaps related to business organizations, but but different uh, in many respects, it would be the co commercial law subject. And yeah. I, I don't teach commercial law, but you, perhaps you can touch on what are the, some of the major right. differences or, or subjects that are touched on in commercial law? How does it differ from business mm -hmm. organizations? I'll say um, commercial law is all about um it's mostly about secured transactions in personal property so not real property and the difference between real property and personal property is basically real properties like you know a residential commercial buildings you know land whereas property is your business your equipment your inventory right and you do it is a major aspect of the solicitor exam. Um, in fact, the, the, the business law um, section of the solicitor exam is split into two. It's split into business um, organizations and commercial law. So commercial law, it, it works the same as uh, property law where these secure transactions in personal property are registered on the Ontario uh, property register, and they're governed by um, the a legis piece of legislation that we refer to as the PPSA, right? Uh, Personal Property Securities Act. So that piece of legislation um, informs us as to who or which secured lender should or ought to have priority over the other, right? So it's all about those semantics and how to understand how how to characterize who should have that priority in the event a debtor defaults. Hmm. Um, big businesses have a lot of secured lenders. Um, I, I don't know if people know this, but you know you have banks, you have other private lenders that uh, take out um, that um, agree. Uh, to secure transactions in a lot of business property, whether it's their equipment, their inventory, um, even consumer goods like uh, your car. If you're leasing a car, that's a secure transaction in personal property. If you default, um, your agreement with the car dealership is registered, um, most likely registered um, on the Ontario uh, uh, personal property registry. So it's a really big big aspect of the solicitor exam and if you do intend to do more solicitor work you want to work in a bank or you want to work in-house for a financial institution or an institution that lends money right um, then i would recommend that you take commercial law i would recommend that you take contract law and business organizations because that will set you up to really understand that that industry right? yeah great um, yeah that was a great great summary and and if i may i'll just you know business organizations for those of you that that are not familiar with the syllabus uh 
is more to do with the different business vehicles uh, that you have for, for running a business, right? So whether it be a sole proprietorship, partnerships, corporations, uh, various types of partnerships, uh, different types of corporate structures that exist. So understanding those different structures and um, more importantly is the allocation of risks between various stakeholders, right? Whether those stakeholders are owners, creditors, suppliers, whatever they may be, right? Sh uh, you know, shareholders, whatever it is. So, so that is um, the business organizations course, um, you know, in comparison with the commercial law course. Now we do have a few questions um, that came through and I think the first, um, Maha says, it's been almost a year that I've sent my documents, but there's no response from the NCA office. So I'm happy to answer that one. Now, if yeah, all of yeah, yeah, if all of your documents have been properly received by the NCA or sent to the NCA over a year ago, then you need to get in touch with them. Okay. Don't don't wait. Um, don't wait another year. Uh, Get in touch with them. They are super responsive. They have hired more staff, more administrative staff to respond to emails. Um, I understand that the offices are open now, um, not completely, but they have essential people who are checking mail, checking the documents that are coming through. And so send them an email um, and say, what's the status of my application? Is there anything outstanding? You know. Um, anything that you still need. Maybe it's possible that they haven't received your transcripts or maybe they have, right? So find out what it is. Don't, you shouldn't wait a year before having to reach out to them. So do reach out to the NCA. They're super friendly. They're on top of things. Um, and the office is open again. There, there was a period of time where they were closed, um, but it is uh, open. It's, it's not at full capacity. Not everybody's working in the office, but it is open and they are checking mail and stuff and they are going through that backlog uh, that they've had of assessments um, but a year is not a typical you know waiting period so definitely reach out to them okay um, the other comment here is uh, perhaps any particular channel for practicing lawyers overseas who wish to practice in Canada Okay, so I, I think um, you're asking what is the process for an overseas lawyer to practice in Canada? And, uh, you know, we can talk about that very generally. Um, so the NCA, um, which is the National Committee on Accreditation, uh, it's a standing committee of the Federation of Law Societies of Canada, and the Federation of Law Societies sets out national standards for education, both in Canada um, for Canadian law schools, as well as uh, foreign trained lawyers who are looking to get accredited in Canada. So uh, the NCA is the body that's going to assess your foreign credentials and you have to apply to them, which you've already done. Um, and then you have to wait for your assessment. And if you do have a qualifying law degree, um, I'm not going to go into the details of what a qualifying law degree is, but look it up on the NCA assessment policy. But if you do have a qualifying law degree, um, then they, they will assign you a number of subjects and those subjects can be taken through self-study exams where right now all of the exams are done online. So you can be in any country you wish to be and you can write these exams from the comfort of your home so long as you have a decent internet connection. Uh, you can now write those exams uh, from anywhere in the world. It used to be the case that you had to fly to Canada or to a testing center, for example, in, in Delhi, they had a testing center in India, um, or you could arrange for a testing center, but you had to pay additional costs for that arrangement. That is no longer the case. You can write your exam from anywhere in the world. It's invigilated online. There's going to be a couple of web cameras and there's going to be proctors watching you. So you can do this from anywhere. And, and it's a huge change and it's, I think, a very welcomed change because for those prospective immigrants that are considering moving to Canada, it's a big step. And it's good to know that you've at least gotten through 
you know, much of the licensing process before you actually pick up and go to Canada, um, where it's unknown, will I be successful or not? You know, can I make it through? At least you've gone through your NCA exams, and then you can say, okay, well, should I pick up and, and move to Canada? Because it's a big move. Um, you know, I, I'm an immigrant to Canada myself, but I was very young when my parents immigrated, um, but they immigrated with me. Uh, I think to Bang as well. Um, so, so you know, we know we know what that's like. I think you know we were younger, so we, we don't have the same stresses as, as our parents did, maybe or adults moving to a new country. But I'm not sure about your experience to Bang, but it, yeah, it's it's quite stressful. Can I practice here? Can I work here? So it's nice that you can get your feet wet in whatever country you're in and start the licensing process and start the examination process. Now, this is not the actual licensing process. So, you know, going through the NCAs uh, and once you've completed the NCAs does not mean that you become a lawyer. Uh, it means that at the end of the process, you should obtain what's called a certificate of qualification, which would then allow you to start the licensing process. And there are different processes in the various provinces and territories. So you have to decide which province or territory you wish to immigrate to. And then you have to read the details um, of that law society, go to their website and read what the qualifications are for becoming a lawyer in that province. Okay. But once you've come, become a lawyer in one of the provinces, it's it's just a matter of money to move jurisdictions, basically. So, so it's quite easy to become licensed in a different jurisdiction. Uh, there are just fees and costs involved. And, and save Quebec, uh, though, which is a civil, uh, civil and common jurisdiction, um, you need to have civil background and you need a different assessment. The NCA assessment will not uh, work. You have to go through the Barreau du Québec uh, to get assessed and licensed uh, through them, okay? Um, so another question came through is, do I have to move to Canada to practice? Can't I just stay overseas and just get a license? Tuvang, do you want to? You know, I was thinking about this the other day because yeah. we're, we're pretty much online now, though I think for urgent matters and trials, please don't quote me on this. Hmm. For urgent matters and trials, I think they are still appearing in person. So outside of that and outside of the our time zone differences, I don't see how... I think, like, it, I think it's a question for the Law Society, actually. So yeah. I don't know. Um, I, I actually had, um, had dinner with a judge uh, a few weeks ago um, in Toronto. And, and we had this conversation about whether the judges had to be in Ontario because because mm. they were having hearings online. And I'm like, can you go to cottage and do your hearings? Yeah, sure. You can go to the cottage. I'm like, can you go to Costa Rica <laughs> or something or like, you know, just be on right. vacation and do your hearing? She's like, oh, I don't know if the chief you know, justice would like that. Yeah. So, so I mean, of course, the judiciary is, is separate and apart from the bar. But um, uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I think there are things that you may be able to do uh, from anywhere, um, which is fine. I, d I don't know if there are any restrictions. Um, mm -hmm. I know that, um, for example, Commissioner of Oaths now, I read that there, there were some changes in the law. And of course, none of this is legal advice. You should look up the information yourself. Yeah. We're, we're not here dishing out legal advice. But um, I, I do remember reading some changes uh, saying that you can commission oaths, they no longer uh, have to be in person, they can be online, and the commissioner itself uh, does not have to be in Ontario either, which is interesting. Right. So um, so there's that. Now, I think that's different than, than notarizing documents, but at least commissioning documents. Um, yeah, I think with litigation, we're, we're swearing our affidavits now electronically as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I don't think there's a definite answer to that question. I think it could be mm -hmm. you know, if we keep on this trajectory and it develops, perhaps maybe. Yeah, um, um, I, I think it, you know you also should check your local bar. So wherever mm -hmm. you are, you know, physically located, because in Ontario, for example, if you move to Ontario, 
you can't practice. Um, I think you said you're from Pakistan, right? So you can't pack practice in Ontario. You can't practice Pakistani law yeah. um, without being licensed by the Law Society of Ontario to do so. You need to be licensed as a foreign legal practitioner, I think it's called, and you need to obtain a certificate for that, and you have to pay an annual fee for that, and and you fall under the, the jurisdiction of the Law Society of Ontario. So you have to look look at your local rules as well to see if it'll allow mm. you to practice foreign law you know, while being physically present in that jurisdiction. Oh, I see. I, I thought he was asking once he's qualified in Ontario, whether or not he could uh, practice any from anywhere around from, the world. From anywhere. Yeah. So I don't, so I don't uh, you know, I don't know, because if the local bar doesn't allow you to practice Ontario law without being licensed uh, as mm. a foreign legal practitioner for Ontario law. Right. Um, like, like you would have to if you move to Ontario and you wanted to practice, you know, Pakistani law or you wanted to practice, you know, law from any other country, you cannot do so. The Law Society of Ontario does not allow you to do so unless you mm -hmm. are registered as a foreign legal practitioner. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm sure there are you know, a number of nuances you have to look into. We don't know them all, of course, and uh, just those are some considerations you should you should think about. But great questions, and uh, um, that's very good. Appreciate those comments and questions. And uh, you know, even even after this session ends and uh, the live session is over, this video will stay up. So for those watching the replays, you're welcome to comment on the videos as well and post questions, and um, we'll likely do some follow up or, or follow up sessions as well. Um, so we are kind of you know we talked about those topics that I wanted to discuss. We discussed commercial law towards civil procedure contract. And we also talked about remedial plans. So um, that's kind of what I set out to do today. So um, that's great for a first session here. Um, right. You know, to bang, you can find him on our, you know, on he's a mentor for our, for students. We have a free mentorship program um, mm. for new or, or recent immigrants to the country or people considering immigrating to Canada. So if you look at our website, which is nca-tutor.com, we have a tab called Mentorship, and we have, uh, I think we're over 20 lawyers now uh, that have been mentoring students uh, for free, of course. Um, there's no charge for this program. And, uh, you know, of course, we're limited in the number of lawyers we have uh, to mentor, but uh, we hope to continue growing that program, adding more mentors to it. So you can click on that link and, and sign up. And um, whenever a lawyer frees up, then we do assign new mentees to the mentors. So, you know, please uh, do visit that website and do register and, and hopefully we can pair you with somebody. Um, there's kind of an application to fill out. It asks you, you know, whether you want to, you know, a mature lawyer or, or a female or male. And, you know, there's a bunch of questions that you, doesn't necessarily mean we, we're going to pair you up exactly because we don't have all the lawyers in the world, but uh, we'll do our best to try and pair you with somebody um, uh, uh, that way. Okay, uh, any final thoughts, um, perhaps? Closing, yeah. closing thoughts um, on, on where to cite the process and, and, um, or tips I, for students? Yeah. I, think, I think for students that are you know, really serious about practicing on Ontario, one of sort of my biggest recommendations is uh, you know, put, yourself, put yourself out there you know, and, and start, start thinking about forming really strong relationships with 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 lawyers that are already in the field because really that's what we depend on as foreign trained trained lawyers um, we're coming from the outside in there is a challenge so you know don't don't hesitate or waste time and i think i kind of made this mistake too to to get out there and, and let people know who you are and you know we can say whatever we want to say but ultimately it's your work that's going to speak you know for you so make sure you you leave a good impression when you're working on files and always put your all yeah yeah Tavang, as always thank you so much
Thank you for being a great resource you know, to all the candidates out there. And, uh, and I'm happy to have you on our team as a, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so we're logging off to Vang and I will stay on uh, for a bit. But uh, thank you again to everybody that was watching. And we hope to see you again soon. Um, um, we're going to try and get some of our other mentors on here uh, on a more regular basis. So uh, stay tuned for, for follow-up sessions.